not on Twitch yet, but oh, we okay. hit the stay. We're ready. Hey, there we are. Hey. Hi, everybody. I'm Otter with Real Women of Gaming, and I'm getting an echo, so I'm going to try and figure out why I'm getting an echo. Um, you mute your Twitch? I didn't even know I had Twitch up. If you have it up. I don't even believe I have it up at the moment, but it seems to be gone. Okay, so I'm, I'm not hearing it anymore if you guys aren't hearing it, but it's hearing a bit of an echo. Um, I am Otter. I am social media director at Real Women of Gaming. And if you didn't know, if you just wandered in here uh, without knowing what this is, this is the Consent in Gaming panel. So um, just we're just going to go around and introduce yourself and tell us what your background is. And why don't we start with you, Jack? Okay. Hello, everybody. I am uh, Jack Birkenstock, Jr. I'm executive director and one of the founders of the Bodana Group. We're a 50C, uh, 501c3, that's right, uh, nonprofit that uses uh, tabletop gaming, board, and RPG for education, skill building, and therapy. Uh, we also offer a host of other services, consultation, training. Uh, we've published two books on therapeutic applications called Wizards, Warriors, and Wellness. <clears throat> we also have our own Twitch channel. Bo oh. He seems to have locked have up. Twitch channel. <laughs> oh, yeah. What's that? Did I lock up there? Yeah, locked up there. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, I'll, I'll go over my deeds at the end of where you can follow us, but we're Bodana and we do a whole bunch of stuff involving gaming, so I don't want to take up uh, <laughs> the rest of the panel's time. So, uh, yes, it's great to be here. Okay, so we will move over to uh, Menachem. Thank you. Hi, I'm Menachem Cohen, he, they. I am a spiritual director, interspiritual rabbi, and a tabletop game designer. A lot of my work is in the design and use of tabletop role-playing games to answer big questions about like, who am I? Why am I here? What makes me come alive? And I stream with the Cast Gamers, the community of applied spiritual and therapeutic tabletop gamers. And particularly want to mention our Gaze of Our Lives show, Queer People Playing Queer Games that I stream with. And I have a talk show with Tanya called Tabletop Transformations where we talk about the intersection of games and spirituality. And uh, Tony Vicinda is our next guest. And Avery Alder and Jay Dragon are going to join us on the fourth Thursdays at 9.30 p.m. Eastern time. Nice. Okay. And then we have uh, Tanwin. Hi, um, I'm Tanwin. I'm based in New Zealand. Uh, I live in Hamilton, 40 minutes drive from Hobbiton. Um, and I am, uh, I'm currently doing a PhD research project due, in, due to be submitted in June uh, that looks at the experiences of autistic adults playing tabletop role playing games. Um, and I, uh, I, I'm, I'm enrolled to start my clinical psychology training next year and plan to bring game therapy to New Zealand. Um, I, uh, I set up and run a um, social skill support service for autistic teenagers um, where we play Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and uh, from my understanding, it's the first of its kind in New Zealand. Um, so that's pretty nice. exciting. Um, yeah. Um, and just a quick yes, I'm the social media director, Real, Real Women of Gaming. I've also been working with adults and children with developmental disabilities for 30 years. And um, I'm very excited about this panel because these people are doing things that I am trying to get off the ground in my area. So I'm very excited about everybody here. Okay, so as we said, this is a consent in gaming. So quick, let's just talk about it. What is consent and why is it important to use it? I was going to say, who wants, who wants to take it? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll let Menachem maybe jump in here. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, hold on. we said we were going to keep this part short consent is when everybody someone or someone's agree to partake or participate in something whatever it is and agree to be there until they say no 
I don't agree anymore. It's agreement to participate. Yes. And, and, and I think even further, a lot of people misunderstand the concept of consent to merely mean permission that is given where consent really at it, at its fullest degree is not only that you have the uh, ability and option to say no, but that that option and all that goes along with it is also respected, honored, and heard. So consent is far more than just, oh, yeah, it's okay. Well, you said okay. And no, if that person changes their mind at any point, that voice is heard and respected. That is true consent. I think um, another uh, important part of it is even if people are disappointed with withdrawal of consent, um, to respect and not make that person feel like um, they have ruined anyone's fun by withdrawing their consent. Um, guilting or using emotional blackmail to make someone feel um, bad about having said, you know what, well, I don't want to keep going with this is, um, is also a form of uh, kind of forcing someone to change their mind. Very agreed, very agreed. Um... And you did make a really good point. So actually, everybody made it was that consent has to be ongoing. It has to. It can be removed at any time. Um, and checking in with everybody periodically to make sure people are okay is also part of that. So I mean, everybody does panels on what is consent. I think that we covered it pretty good. Um, why don't we move on to just a quick overview of the types of tools that are available out there? Yeah, it, we, we also kind of agree that we weren't going to spend a whole yeah. ton of time in this. I mean, one, again, it's been covered kind of ad nauseum in, in tons of other different panels and people are, you know, everybody has their favorites. Uh, but some of the most prominent ones that you will see out there is, of course, the X card, which is kind of considered like, you know, one of, one of the grandparents of, of consenting gaming and safety tools. You also have lines and veils, uh, consent flower, which is a nice tool that is predominantly nonverbal. And then, of course, uh, script change uh, from Bo Yeager Sheldon, which is uh, one that is very narratively driven. And uh, again, the idea in general, yeah, I love Menachem that you have those cards just at the ready. Uh, I mean, the, in general, <laughs> the idea of ev multiple different types of consent or safety tool mechanics are that it gives the table a mode of communication by which any player, if they feel uncomfortable, and that doesn't have to mean emotionally uncomfortable. It could be that you are uncomfortable with the content just because maybe you're not in favor of it that night. It might be that it is not lending to your enjoyment of the game. Like it doesn't have to be, this is something so psychologically scarring and jarring that you just cannot live with it being around your environment. It doesn't have to be that severe, uh, but it's that players have a mode of communication that they are able to voice this in a manner that is comfortable to them, which is why no matter what tool it is that you go, and I believe that we have some links for folks, uh, mm -hmm. as well as a tremendously great opus that has been written. It's published for free by Monty Cook Games uh, about consenting gaming, which even explains some of the reasons why it's a great thing. We're going to go into detail about that. But uh, yeah, as long as it, it, having this at your table, whatever tool works for your table is great. If you're doing this there. Yeah, go ahead, Menachem. I do want to point out the uh, cards on the table that Eric Simon put together. It's it's one that says, not what I don't want, it's what I really want to address. And the table agrees on things they want to have happen and address in the game. Nice. So that's the awesome. link is in the, in the chat. I think yeah. consent tools like that are super exciting. Um, where uh, in the consent flower, which will also get added to the chat, um, is is similar to that in that it has both sides and it has the green section which allows you to go yes i'm i'm totally yeah. on board with this and i want to keep going um and i think that's so important because that gives the gm and the other players permission to move forward and permission to explore um rather than shutting down um and and i think uh yeah again it's it's being given that freedom to to explore these kind of slightly more deeper darker things um means that you get more out of their gaming experience consent doesn't just have to be saying what we don't want it can be saying what we do want well and, and it's even it's not that you even have freedom or permission but i think that systems like that 
you know, encourage that shared experience, which again, it, it keeps it on the positive because, you know, there are a lot of naysayers who are like, well, it's controlling or it's whatever. Well, no, if you're, if you're doing it in a way that encourages people to share what they love, <clears throat> it enhances your role play. It makes it better because now people are really digging it and it's, yeah, this is what I want more of, you know, so it's, it's, it could really turn your table into something you never even imagined. <clears throat> Okay, so now we've got what consent is, we've got some tools that can help you um, have these discussions at your table. So I guess the next important topic is why do we, should we have consent? What is it? Why is it important? Because we said so. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's consent, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, no, it's like because we want it because it helps us say the things we want or don't want. It, yeah. it makes safety and it and safety. It's a it's a kind of a Ouroboros. It's a it's, uh, it's safety breeds. Safety allows for consent to happen, and consent allows for safety to happen at the table. They feed each other, right? So when I'm feeling more safe, I can ask for I can participate with consent and ask for things to change or, or be something. And if I can ask for things to be what I need, want them to be, then I feel safer. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's tab tabling on. It's the idea that, you know, if, if you have this agreement and again, it's, it, it's also that other difficult side of, you know, why, why should you have this idea of, well, we've all sat around the table. We've all agreed to what it's going to happen. Well, a lot of times, especially in the therapeutic realm, you don't always know what's going to happen at that table. So, you know, sometimes it may be, you know, the scenario, it may be the way the person is feeling that day. It might have been a situation that just occurred with them, you know, all, all manner of different reason. But if there's no way for that topic, you know, for people to either broach that they're enjoying it or they're not enjoying it, if there's no communication system, you don't have that interplay, which is part of the true collaborative nature of role playing, like if you look back at old school role playing, which very much was, I'm the DM and I've set, you know, this this world for you, and you need to survive my machinations, you know. And it's like well, that's not what I signed up for. I, I, you know, maybe I want to tell a story. If you want that old school thing and you've all agreed to it, we're not telling you how to play. That's not what safety tools are about. It's about agreement it's about acknowledging when we're going in the right direction or when we're going in the wrong direction so we're going into the tables direction of of where where we want it to go i found more enhancement from safety tools than i have a, any other way of injecting because people are like ah oh, cool all right here yeah this is where we're going i like this this is nice you know yeah this is something that um came up in my research a lot um, in my interviews with uh, with autistic adults who'd play tabletop role playing games. Um, a lot of them, well, pretty much all of them actually talked about consent and how it related to um, their own agency and their autonomy at the game, like at, at the table. And um, I had really strong findings around um, the fact that uh, kind of, the engagement in the game and the ongoing kind of exploration and development of understanding and, and, and um, these deeper relationships were really um, related to feeling supported and safe at the table. And those who had had bad experiences mostly revolved around <laughs> lack of consent. Um, and we, I had people who talked about the fact that, the, that there were some really heavy topics in these home games that came up that that really affected them and um and they hadn't been discussed beforehand and it was incredibly difficult to keep going and of course a, a lot of these participants were coming into these sessions um into these home games um already feeling a little bit like the odd one out and they they often put aside their own feelings and their own experiences to not interrupt and not be a burden on the group. And then they went away and had to process that in their own time and deal with it. And for some, it was still a really long-term issue that they were still working on. And, um, and I think it's, uh, it's really important 
um, to have these tools to give people permission to actually say, hey, look, I'm not feeling comfortable here. Um, because the last thing I want for a player at my table is to feel uncomfortable. And um, and especially to feel uncomfortable, but also not not look after themselves by saying something about it. Um, I would hate to find out after the fact that, that a player has gone away and had a really long time having to process what went on at the table. So it's all about and kind of giving those players the, the confidence to, to then use these tools to explore and understand and, and develop this kind of sense of belonging. Well, <clears throat> and, and, I'm sorry, Menachem, were you going to go? I, I, I had a thought. Was, sure, was gonna, go ahead. I was giving an example in the even in casual games and in therapeutic or spiritual gaming, the consent is important for allow us to have fun or to do our work. So, for one example, the, with the cast gamers, we've been playing. We played a, a, a twelve episode campaign of Kids on Brooms, and I played a character who had spent years in this wasteland, and his his birth father was also been missing for most of his life. And we found him again, and we had him for a few minutes, and he 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 had a, he disappeared again. And I got a I got started getting hints from what the game master was saying that he was thinking one possibility was my dad was going to be dead, and a spirit talking to us. And so I was able to say because of safety with the group, I was able to say, no, my dad's not dead. Do a lot of possibilities, but my dad, I want my dad to be alive in the game. And it could have just been fun that it would I didn't it wouldn't be a fun game if my if my character's dad was dead after waiting for him for all these years but it might have also related to the fact that my father's passing just four years ago right but in the therapeutic space a character having a missing dad who comes back could be a very powerful tool for processing right and for the player to say no I need my character my dad to be alive so I I was I had this agency which was consent in the game to allow the game to be fun for me and potentially therapeutic. And, and, and kind of like tabling off of both of those points, you know, a lot of people look at this as either like, like it's a pass fail kind of ideology where either, <clears throat> you know, consent is allowed or topics aren't allowed or they are allowed or whatever. But I mean, just the, the idea, cause we found a lot in a lot of our therapeutics is the players just knowing that they had the ability to say no at any point and that that was respected gave a comfort level like it was almost like a level of cushioning that okay i because when we talk about things like resilience whether it's emotional resilience or what have you a lot of times people are like you know i use the phrase you know let's get uncomfortable with the uncomfortable because you know and there's a lot of talk about you know what exactly is a trigger what does that mean if something is is what's the difference between I'm uncomfortable versus I'm triggered. And that's a very big discussion point. And I've always felt that a lot of our players are kind of like, okay, this is feeling, yeah, as, as uh, Bo uses in script change, you know, I feel kind of squick about this, right? Like, I'm not saying I, I don't want it. I'm not saying it's great. It just, I feel uncomfortable. Let me sit with that discomfort to explore and allow where it might go. And I think that that freedom to know that a person has that if, if it's too much, I can close this off. That it's a it's a it's a strengthening, it's an empowering tool that allows me to then sit with that discomfort to the point of knowing I can shut this off whenever it's too much. So it actually, in some ways, has helped some people build their resilience to emotionally uncomfortable material. Just the presence of the tool itself. We don't even have to talk about it. But just knowing I have that that sword to pull out, if you will, is is sometimes more powerful than the actual discussion about the content. Okay, I have one yeah. quick comment that I want to go in. I just want to do because so, um, I have a comment from Fox Enigma. Um, Hallie, we will get to your question, but it might be answered with later on. So I'm going to hold on to your question for now. Um, Fox Enigma says. The communication system can be an issue if you can only talk to the DM slash players, and then all of a sudden one person becomes the villain slash scapegoat of what's causing issues. This is coming from my own personal experience. I, I, I definitely say I would, I would agree with that, but I think it goes back to the, like, I, I've always had the standpoint when Bo and I have talked in other panels 
it comes down to the idea that just merely saying that you, and I think we are going to get into this, I, I think in a way, right? So I, I hope I don't want to gild yeah. the lily too much, but I think the idea that you can't just say, we have a safety tool, so we have a safe table. I, I've always been of the mind, and maybe this is the fact that I've done work with sexual abuse and trauma for like well over 20 years. So the idea of until you have an unsafe moment at your table, when that tool is actually used, I don't know necessarily if you can truthfully say you have a safe table because mm -hmm. I don't know as a player if what I'm going to say is going to quote unquote bum everybody out or if I'm going to like suck the air out of the room or what have you. So the idea of until you have that moment and then you talk through that moment and it's just a very, I'll try to make this a very short example. So we were running uh, COVID support groups for a local university in Bodana. And the whole idea was these are all students who were not interfacing with each other. So we were running D&D &D to help people connect during the pandemic. And we had a moment where one of the players was like, well, I don't want any corpse looting. No corpse looting. And he was specifically talking about dragons. So we kind of talked through it and we were like, okay, we just want to understand because no corpse looting means no leather armor. It means no spell components. Like what level does this go to? That wasn't the important part. The important was we had a very drawn out discussion, making sure everybody was heard. And at the end of that conversation, one of the other players at the table, uh, it was black said, okay, I'm going to speak up right now. He said, I don't want anything involving racism in this game. And the player who brought up the dragon issue said, well, wait a minute though. If we don't talk about racism, how are we going to work through racism? And, and the other person was like, I live racism. I, I've had the M word spray painted and scratched into my car. I don't need it in my game. And that then led to a longer discussion about that topic. And even after going back and talking to the players afterwards, if we didn't have quote unquote, the silly little talk about dragons, the players around the table, he was like, I would have never have felt safe talking about something serious like that. And even bringing it up, he says, but you broke the seal. Like we had a conversation, everyone felt that they were being respected in what their opinions were about something fairly innocuous, but it led to the fact that a player said, okay, now's my time, bang. It, and, and, they, and they broached it out and the group agreed upon everything and it was just so magical and we didn't expect it to go there. We didn't say, okay, you know, lines and veils, you say at the beginning, no one wants to be a flat lever, right? No one wants to break the vibe or whatever. So I, I think until you have an unsafe moment and how you navigate that unsafe moment, I, I think really has a lot to do with, and I believe it was, um, it was someone said it earlier in the panel, this is not a once and done thing. This is a growing, living contract around the table that must be reviewed it must be revisited it must be you know reminded that this is something that we you know so it's important isn't yeah hey, we got the safety crap out of the way all right let's just play okay body horror let's go whoa hey hold on <laughs> you know what i mean so i i, I think that's really important and I, I hope that addresses the question in a way i want to touch on fox's question a little bit as well and that um it sounds like this is a, 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 a home game um, where, the, where Fox has had, or where it's a, a case of um, bringing this kind of thing up as you're playing um, with a group that hasn't necessarily discussed consent or, or um, with a GM who's not really that experienced in managing these kinds of discussions. And um, that's something that I have come across a lot in in some of the work some the the kind of club work that I've done where I've I've run the Waikato role playing guild um for my region um where we have a lot of players coming in saying hey I brought this up this this issue up with the GM and they think I'm just making problems um and that is mm. I think something that can be really difficult to navigate um and it is there's a lot of responsibility on the GM, but also responsibility on the players um, to to kind of accept the um, the responsibility and, and 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 work through that consent together. Um, and sometimes it, it it can happen in that session zero, and just it, it, one of the players before any issues comes up, or the GM themselves could say, "Hey, I just want to discuss." 
consent and I want to discuss maybe we can introduce this tool because we're we're thinking we might explore some pretty dark things or um but it is it's really it can be really hard when the when the other players or the GM or both don't have much experience or interest in using um consent tools uh and in those situations uh unfortunately we have to stand up for ourselves and say um and say, look, I'm not comfortable moving forward with this game without some kind of consent and without some kind of discussion. Um, so, yeah, so I can understand the the plight that um, Fox has got there. Um, and sometimes it's about kind of deciding if this group is not going to listen to my feelings and listen to how I, how I want to play this game, then maybe it's time to step out for myself. Um, and again, with with the number of games that are available, and sometimes it can be really hard to find a group that you click with. Um, it's about still looking looking after yourself um, and finding find going out and finding a different group potentially. Did you want to weigh in on this, Menachem? I think everybody covered it. Okay, um, I will say that uh, that uh, Fox Enigma did uh, respond again and said, um, I'd honestly prefer to play in person. Online can be difficult for numerous reasons. I had to bow out respectfully as I did cause some issues. I would respectfully say you did not cause issues. <laughs> you stood up for yourself. Yeah, um, that, and that though it became... Match. Yeah, though it became kind of like a three strike thing and felt I had to leave the campaign, which sometimes you have to do for your own sake. You need to leave this yeah. kind of thing. And it might and it might just be the fact that, I mean, if we look at things societally, if we look at, you know, not everyone is taught through either, you know, the culture of their family or the culture of their groups that, you know, to talk openly about feelings. Most of us are, unfortunately, we most people are taught quite the opposite, that we don't, we don't talk about that or ruin the fun of the game. Well, maybe it might lead to more discovery about what we want. So I think sometimes people are just nervous about broaching that concept to the uncomfortable. Again, I, just what I've worked in for 20 years, there is very little that shocks me. So having those conversations to get it deep, you know, that's, again, that's something I was trained in but also had the benefit of very open parents who were like, no, talk about what you feel. And I, so it's not an issue for me, but again, it might come down to maybe there's some groups that are more comfortable than others. And that, you know, might just might not be the right climate for you. And that doesn't make you wrong or that group wrong. You can always improve, but yeah, it's, it's tough. It's tough for a lot of folks. That actually leads really naturally into um, Hallie's question, which is um, if someone does not get consent for something that they do in game, how would you recommend handling the situation either, either for the person harmed or for the one who did the harming? And this does lead into our question about consent conversations. Who wants to jump first? <laughs> we haven't heard much from Menachem. <laughs> uh, I'm just kind of brain, brain slow. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, one. Oh, sorry. Um, Did you want I me to repeat the, the question? Things... Was that what you were going to ask, Jack? That I repeat the question? That's, that's what I was going to ask. Yes, oh, I'm reading mind. it. Go ahead, Tanwin. Yeah. Um, okay. So the the I think um, uh, one of the big things um, that I have always really encouraged at my tables is those open discussions about um, whether people feel safe um, and whether people want to proceed with certain things. Um, and so uh, I. I I also I like Jack. I have come from a family where my mum was a clinical psychologist. Well, my mum is a clinical psychologist. So, so I've always been encouraged to stand up for my feelings and and talk about what's going on and be have those really open and honest discussions. And so when we've had these sorts of things come up in our own home game or in um, the sessions that I run through work, uh. I don't mind being the person who stands up and goes, Hey, I just saw something that I don't appreciate. And I think, I think that we need to discuss what just happened. Um, 
and so so having someone who can kind of stand up and say look I think we need to work through this um but I also think it's uh sometimes uh the person who gets affected by it may not say it in the moment um or may not um may not make that really outward expression to to show that they're uncomfortable um and so I try to make it really clear if I think that anything's come up but that person hasn't kind of made a point of showing that they're uncomfortable I might send them a private message or I might write a little note and just say hey you okay um and and letting them decide whether it gets discussed there and then or whether they whether they want to kind of work through it themselves and then come back to it um but it is about uh stepping up and and bringing up what's happened and trying to have someone be a mediator um doesn't necessarily have to be the gm because the gm could be the one of the people in this situation um but I think yeah, having having someone be a mediator and be able to give get get kind of what has actually happened and really go through and, and break it down, um, and then highlight from a non-accusatory point of view what has happened, um, rather than saying, "Well, you did this and I felt this way." Um, talking about when we when we play through these themes, I get uncomfortable because of these reasons, and. Um, I want to highlight what what happened in the game because some people might just not even have realized that they stumbled into that. Um, so yeah, really important to give people the opportunity to talk it through without um, without pointing fingers too much. Okay, I just wanted to ask a quick question just because of something that you said that just struck me when you said, um, I'm uncomfortable when we play through this and for this reason. Do you think it's always important to give a reason? Because if no, someone not necessarily okay, because um, I I know that sometimes I'm not comfortable saying well if I can't tell them why I don't like this and I don't want to tell them why I don't like this then maybe I should just keep my mouth shut and I just wanted to get your opinion. Yeah, um, um, I think there will be there are some people who will want those reasons, but I try really hard to not require that reason. Um, I think that's the very basis of things like the X card where you can, you can tap that card and you don't have to explain why. Um, and, uh, and I think it comes up in script change as well, which I think Menachem was pulling up the cards just then. So I'm going to let yeah. you jump in there. But the thing, <laughs> safety tools are for the game master too, mm. right? So we can be, we can go, hold on. There, something just happened here. I want to talk about it, right? We can yeah. stop the action and say, someone so looks like someone's looks like you're upset about something or it looks like something happened that we weren't prepared for let's have a conversation about it yeah i mean the the question of whether or not you know to to because or to not because that is a question it, it is an important question because on one hand if you if uh, we need to make sure to know what the content was that was upsetting we don't necessarily need to know why because if we don't know what was upsetting or yeah. what was disagreeable we're we're going to stumble over that ground again but bear in mind that you know and this kind of goes back to what tamlin was saying about when different people around the table are having different experiences i think sometimes we're very quick to go well my feelings weren't honored so you're a bad person and it's like whoa whoa hold on Let, let's examine there's a very fine line sometimes between someone being an uncaring jerk and someone not having their own good gauge of emotional recognition or emotional vocabulary, maybe we're talking about a person who, like we had said, doesn't maybe know that they've crossed that line. Or, you know, let's talk about, you know, some people, you know, some autistic people, they might have made a statement or might have, you know, there might be a transgression that maybe was not understood. So it, this is why that that discussion becomes so important. Because if we don't learn each other through this discussion and this negotiation, like to me, that that's the proof of the pudding in this. If, if we're not having discussions about why to get to where we want to be, we're never going to get there. Because if we're always just avoiding discussion about it, we're not learning to be comfortable with each other and learning boundaries and setting boundaries. It, unfortunately, that's the best way to learn to manage disagreement is by managing disagreement 
So it, it is difficult because, again, not everyone's trained or experienced in dealing with that, which makes – I think this is what scares a lot of people off from using safety tools. They're like, well, I don't know what the heck to do if someone talks about A, B, C, D, or E. You know, I don't know what's going to happen. Well, I, I would gather that most of the people around the table don't know what's going to happen because maybe they haven't encountered that yet. But mm. – Letting it happen and talking through it, right? Let let's learn together. I don't know. We might see other perspectives. That's a novel concept, right? Uh, so I think that that also, you know, let let's break bread here. You know, let's let's be comfortable with each other. But that's a lot of trust. So there's so many paradigms that come into this. It's not as simple as yeah, I was bothering us because you know my dad hit me. Okay, moving on. You know, it's not that simple. I don't think. And you also brought up preventative medicine here, right? That we can hopefully try and avoid some of these things by the ways we set up the game. Like yeah. not to talk too much about session zero because we're going to have a panel later, but to set expectations and talk about what the game's going to be like in session zero. And you hear a lot about that in like two, two and a half hours or, or an hour and a half, whatever it is. Yep. But, um, you know, and also character creation. When you're when the game master is helping, is working with the players to create characters, you can find out what the character wants, what the player wants to have happen, and what their hopes and expectations are for the game. So you can do this stuff where you front load, right, expectations and set that and set up what people are comfortable with and what they want, even even before you've had sat down together. Totally. And then, of course, r coming back to it and having the occasional kind of session zero point five. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we, we talk about the Madonna training often, yeah. Exactly. Coming coming back um throughout the campaign, even if they haven't had any issues arise, um, being able to say, Hey, kind of how's everyone going with the campaign so far? What do we think of the play style? What do we think of like what I I mean, roses and thorns is something that I've started using a bit more regularly as well, where we go, okay we're going to go do a round table and, and I want everyone to share something that they're liking about this so far. And then something that they're not so happy about. Um, and it can be anything to do with that. play style. Yeah. It's, it's such a cool little tool. And it, and it means that like everyone, including the game master will weigh, on, weigh in on this and it, and it's, and it doesn't have to be consent related. It doesn't have to be theme related. It could just be, I'm not so keen on the mechanic of this or, I haven't enjoyed how long combat takes or something. Um, mm. But it could be those moments that open, open that discussion and um, having, uh, I, we recently ran um, through our community group, a, uh, a regular play um, session. Um, basically it was an eight session long campaign um, and we're offering different systems. Uh, and I ran monster of the week and uh, my co-DM uh, ran Delta Green. And so Delta Green is a conspiracy horror, quite an yeah. intense game. Um, and he warned them right at the start, characters are going to die. <laughs> like, yeah. We might all go through three or four different characters in this eight session arc. Um, and he did Roses and Thorns at the end of every single session to make sure that everyone had opportunities to bring up what they were enjoying and what they weren't enjoying. And it was a really quick and casual way to introduce that. Um, I did Rose and, Roses and Thorns at the end of our little arc, um, but we also did the RPG consent checklist by Monty Cook, who in the, in the session building, in the, in the world building session, to kind of really clarify what it was that people were, were comfortable with or, or what people wanted to actually move forward with and, and, and explore during the game. Um, and so we decided that our game was going to be much more lighthearted compared to Delta Green. Um, and uh, and we, it was very much kind of Buffy the Vampire. <laughs> um, and so, so we, we had an X card on the table to make sure that everyone could use it at any point and no one did. And so when we came back to that final session, I wanted to go through those roses and thorns more as a, as a learning opportunity for other people um, and for myself, because it was my first time officially running that session. So a bit of that system, but, um, but yeah, so the Delta green comparison was 
making sure to use that tool every single session to give people opportunities to talk if they needed to. Yeah, a similar thing we do uh, with cast, cast, which I learned from my colleague, Davi Weasley, who's a pastor who did spiritual direction and gaming work, was each game, we have a briefing and a debriefing where we ask each player questions, like what are your comments, questions, or concerns about today's game, and then we usually a themed question around the game at the end we check out and check about favorite moments in the game and another you know or and a themed another themed question and those aren't explicitly consent but what they do is kind of what you're talking about with roses and thorns they set up this atmosphere where people get to express themselves and talk about what was good and what they liked in the game or where they have a concern you know i'm concerned about this we're going to that character that someone's Gonna, might die this episode and that's really going to be hard you know people can voice those concerns before the game and it sets up that safety yeah and, he, and even with script change they use the idea of highlight reels and the rap meeting where highlight reels are you know it, it, just pick a moment from the game that you thought was awesome it, it could be something deep it could be something kind of a a one-off or man that was really cool the way that blah 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 you know and that again like you said that's setting up that it's okay to share and, and again, the more that we converse, the more that we talk about these things, the more that that makes it okay to talk about the surface level stuff. So when we do have to dive below, we know that, that it, it's okay to dive in. It, it's, a, it's all right to do that. You know, it's funny. Um, when we had our meeting, our pre-panel meeting a couple of days ago, um, the next day I started a new one-on-one -on -one with someone. And I was very nervous because um, while I've played for a lot of years, I'm fairly new to storytelling, to being on the other side of the screen. And the both of you, uh, Jack and Menachem, had mentioned um, doing this wrap up. What'd you like? Was there anything? And I did that with her and it made me feel so good. She told me what she really and she told me and she didn't have any complaints yeah it's the first episode of course um but yeah <laughs> but she was like oh i loved this about it and i'd never thought of that and she could really tell i had really based this entire thing around her character that she and she really loved that which is very easy to do with a one-on-one -on -one. a lot easier than when you're working with a whole group but i really want to thank you both for giving me that idea and it's something i'm going to carry into the future with things Kitty. <laughs> Sorry, when, if I see an animal, I have to come. Like, we've been <laughs> away for the required kitty, days. required cat in the, so, in the call. Yeah, yeah it has he's to being be. very clingy. <laughs> now it's a real stream because a uh, yes. cat has mm. appeared. Yep, absolutely. He's not. He's very camera shy though. He doesn't like being in front of the camera. <laughs> one of my players in one of my games, uh, his dog always like she's like obsessed with him and she will sit right next to him and stare at him the entire stream so she's become our our mascot she's so cute <laughs> um so. i think we had a quick question from jen um about highlighting the difficulty of not turning your camera on <laughs> online <laughs> yeah you, do you mean it just in a session um i i don't know i think, I think that has... Yeah, chat, I, but... I think Jen uh I think Jen uh had made that comment um because I if I'm not oh because now she's in on it on her other account. Oh, <laughs> yeah, she's now okay. she's now in FTW freelancing. Was that a real question, uh Jen, or was that just because uh, we saw you for a brief second when you got in? <laughs> I no, i I mean just to briefly answer it, I, I've had some folks in our therapeutic sessions that you know, one person in particular requested if they if they didn't mind because they had some body dysmorphia uh, and looking at themselves in the camera was problematic to them. So mm -hmm. we, you know, just, just discussed it to the group. And we were like, hey, this and everybody was, yeah, if you feel comfortable, turn it back on. If you don't, that's cool. And, and you know, again, conversations like that were only we were only able to have the, that level of conversation because we had set up that environment like so yeah i i personally i don't see any problem if uh 
I mean, as long as the person's participating and they're still kind of involved, because, you know, that's another thing is, what are you like, you know, playing Minecraft or something? Like, what, you know, what's going on back there? But, yeah, I, that's yeah. at least my opinion. I'd rather so, see people yeah. face it. Oh, it's allowed people to participate who wouldn't otherwise participate to have their camera mm -hmm. off and just be voice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I always prefer I think, to yeah. be able to see, but. I would prefer not to be able to see than to not have someone play. I uh, I have had this um, more for technical reasons as well, um, where we had last uh, in 2020, um, <laughs> when we went into lockdown for the first time, um, we had, uh, we very quickly had to switch our, our sessions to online. And I know that the tech that people had wasn't really up to scratch we had some people who who lived out in the country and didn't have very good internet connections and so they couldn't turn on their cameras um and so yeah so we luckily were able to address that from the perspective of um the the kind of tech side of things and i think that was a really good way to open that up and, and give people permission to not have their video on um and and without having to bring up um why people necessarily didn't want their cameras on um yeah so mm -hmm. i think for me i prefer it if i can see people's faces just like menachem but i uh, i also recognize that some people yeah some people aren't super comfortable with it so um so jen uh actually <laughs> added more to it and it was how do you manage group dynamics my biggest thing is talking over each other And that's kind of out of the scope of this panel, but if anybody has would like to <laughs> say anything about that. I, mean, I was about... thinking about general game master approaches, which is kind of tangential to the question. You know, is that like, how? Do, what is your game mastering style? Does it promote a, a, a safe place? Does it promote a place of cooperation? Like the game master can ask one person to speak at a time or raise your hand to speak kind of things like you do in any zoom meeting but i was i was also thinking about like i remember once when we were, I mean, my kid who's 15 now was starting to play games and was believing the the game master the dungeon master's job was to try and kill the play characters right and that that's like i i cr quickly corrected that misconception but there are people who believe this right and, and yeah sorry I, I um who play that way and um the the game master style could really affect the safety and tone of the game and like doing something like world building with your characters and letting the characters build and talk you know walk into a bar they get to describe the bar right or you can play arium or tel microscope with people to set up the world beforehand which also gives more agency when you do world building or the questions and kids on brooms right where mm -hmm. Player and kids on bikes, you ask relationship questions about all the other characters, and that gives it gives not only does it give the game master material to build the world with and plot, but it also gives the players agency that the that things that they want to see will happen. Well, it, and it's also part of that how the collaborative process operates because one of the things I've always loved about the kids on bike series questions is everybody has to agree with that so so again and this might fall more to session zero but just how much you engender that conversation of how like is that okay with you like we even had situations where one kid was playing a brutish jock and the other was playing a nerd and it was always like oh, i'm bullying the nerd and every single time i would ask the, the character who was playing the nerd are you okay being bullied again and the player was like yes thank you very much for asking okay but that sets a tone as the game master of oh, we're going to make sure that it's okay with both persons in this arrangement so they that even collaborative process gets people used to working together so you've already set that that stage and i i think it like menachem said it goes the same way with you know who's talking at one time i mean part of it is okay guys we should probably figure out a way to do this otherwise no one's going to hear anyone else so it's even to me like a natural way to just work through setting boundaries, respecting boundaries, you know, a lot of the, cause we have interruptions at regular tables, not just in the online environment where people are talking over each other, or we mm -hmm. use private message. Like if you want to drop a comment or MST 3k to session, just drop your riff in, in the, in the, in the chat 
That way it's, you know, not disrupting the actual flow. So it's even using tech in a different way to let them, yeah, if you want to keep riffing at what's going on, go ahead. You're not interrupting directly, so you're still being respectful. So there's different ways to do it, and it, it depends on your group. Okay, so um, there was one last topic that we had talked about, and I think we covered it fairly well, but I just wanted to make sure that we covered all the parts of that topic, and that was um, what it means to create a safe space and the challenges in creating safe space. Because we've talked a lot about how the uh, how giving people so that they feel comfortable bringing things up. How do we foster that so that people will use these tools, will will feel comfortable speaking up when things aren't, when they feel their consent has been broken? I feel like we've touched on this um, we have a number a of times throughout yeah. this discussion, but, um, but I think the biggest thing for me is modeling it myself and yeah showing that I'm doing it and, and checking in with other players. And um, even when I'm being a player myself, um, speaking up and going, Hey, kind of, we need to be a little bit careful here or making sure that I am using the consent tools that I'm putting on the table for the players to use. Um, and yeah, like, like Menachem said, you can, the, the consent tools are for the GMs as well. Um, it's not and, and so modeling, and showing that you're comfortable with doing it is um, is really important to give other people that sense that they can do it. Um, Thirsty Star Lesbians, I believe, and other games use, they give you experience or advancement for using safety tools. Mm. So they oh, build it mechanically into the game. I so just you, picked you can, that up, but I haven't had a chance to look yeah. at it yet. You can add your own way of making it mechanically relevant. Nice. Yeah, it it, it really, I mean, it, it, I think especially with like a lot of the younger players that we have in group, the whole idea of, you know, it's not a traditional type of group environment, at least from the therapeutic, like it's not like we f stop every five seconds to ask a feelings question or whatnot. We let the narrative drive it. So I think in, in certain examples, especially if you're leading the way, like I press the pause button in script change more than most of my players do. Because in those situations, they're like, you know, we had this uh, one situation where it was like, a, you know, a, a, a moment where we were kind of diving into a character's home life and the, and the character was kind of sharing an uncomfortable moment that, you know, the, why this character did not get along with their older sister. And we asked some questions and it was because of, um, shall we say, some, uh, you know, very nefarious behavior. Um and so the table was stunned when this revelation came out at the table. It was like, no, my character, you know, she, she molested him. That was the whole thing. We were like, everybody was silent and quiet and like no one knew what to do. So I was like, okay, so we're going to push the pause button for a moment. I'm not going to say what anybody is feeling. Like I didn't want to interpret it for them. But I kind of said, like, I'm going to push it because I'm noticing that everyone's kind of a little quiet kind of showing them it's okay to interrupt the game if something is uncomfortable. Let that, just like Tamwin said, that leading the way, that role modeling, it's not only showing that it's okay, but it's also legitimately showing the use of the tool and how you would implement it. So that way they know it's okay because you're the facilitator, right? You're the person in charge, so to speak. But it also shows them the tool in progress. So it, 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 belies like a tr I trust it and I'm running the group so we can trust it we're going to examine this process together and it, and it was very it, it was a very good outcome of that situation that everybody felt like oh okay we can talk about this all right I I thought it was just me that felt kind of you know icky about the whole thing no everybody else felt the same way uh and everyone was too nervous to say anything because they didn't want to like you know, jam up this player's flow or whatever, but by the time that we got through that initial <gasps> kind of moment, everybody's like, oh, okay, and we had deeper conversations down the line, so yeah. Okay, so are there any more questions that people have? Um, we've only got about five, well, we've got about three or four minutes left. Um, if you have a question, you don't want to type it in, um, go ahead and just unmute yourself to ask your question. 
that's fine at this point. I just saw that Fox has asked, um, how do we handle role playing outside of the actual session? Oh, I missed that one. I'm so sorry. So I think that um, that kind of relates to to um, potentially player and GM role playing private character moments. Maybe is that correct, Fox? Uh, I meant more so like just RP in general, because uh, in the other group that I was on, they started using threads and separate stuff, and it got hard to kind of manage everything. Well, so like they were kind of continuing things out, like continuing rp with each other and and with the gym like in threads outside of session time yeah exactly oh, okay oh it, it became a little unmanageable because sometimes i would be really busy i work from home i do tech support so i have plenty of free time but some of the people didn't and then i would be a little like oh no should i do this should i do that mm. I think that's a that's a really difficult one because um, I I've seen it happen in my own um, in some groups that I've been a player in and I get I get social media fatigue so quickly these days <laughs> um, and so I'm terrible at responding to messages anyway and then trying to keep up with these huge message chains of Edmund did this and and Trixie did this it's it just kind of gets it gets too much. Um, and so I've I have said to the players, um, to the other players and the GM in that group, that's a Call of Cthulhu game, um, that I'm not going to engage with that kind of thing outside of the game. Um, and that if the if anything happens in those discussions that's important to the game itself, that I that I need cliff notes <laughs> before we get back into into playing. Um and uh, sometimes it can just be kind of that behind the scenes fun thing, fun things that aren't going to necessarily impact gameplay. Um, but as soon as it starts heavily affecting gameplay, that's when I would be speaking up and saying, hey, I can't keep up with this. So you need to inform me in a short form of, of what it was that happened that's important to my character. I mean, there there's some systems that actually rely upon that. Invisible Sun, also for Monty Cook Games, is one of those very. It's a very meta experience where it's it's almost like a a real life simulation kind of a life. But I again, I think that I'll I'll default to our colleagues later on. Are going to talk about session zero that. That, to me, is a pretty strong line that you should establish right at the beginning because, like, you know, our, our kids in our groups, they're going to strategize. They have Discord space that they use that they talk about the game in between. But it's kind of like if it if it's something that would require a role, it can't be said to have happened outside. And, again, it may get difficult at certain points to kind of rein that in I, I because we've had players who have tried to meta or monopolize Oh well, we decided this is going to happen. I was like, "Really? What? What do you mean? We you got a rabbit in your pocket? Like we didn't? No, this <laughs> was wasn't a group we? thing. Like what? Is, I don't understand what you're talking about here. That expectation, um, right? Yeah. Yeah. Set set them, but also follow them because follow them. Yeah, absolutely. Because they they can get out of hand real quick. Okay, I mean, we are. We are about to get kicked out of here because the next panel, I'm already seeing some of the people from the next panel coming in. And that's a really, another really important one. And that's, oh, hell no, uh, being a minority in horror. So I can already see some of the, the panelists for that are lining up to uh, just throw us out. Um, but you're more than welcome to stay. <laughs> Um, but we're just going to have to turn off our cameras, <laughs> but I just want to, I just want to thank the three of you for doing this with me. And if any of you would like to join for the session zero, I know, um, I know you can't Tamwin, but, uh, Jack and Menachem, I did lose a panelist. So if you decide you want to come, because I know you guys do have a lot to say about session zero and you held yourself back. So if you want to come and throw some things in there, I'd love to have you. And that's at nine o'clock. So I'll, I'll, I'll look into it. Thank you. All right. Yeah, most <laughs> Thanks definitely. So Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for, yeah. Thank you, Tamlin. Right. Yeah.
for joining. Yes. yes, thank you. Thank you for having me. So kind of, of slightly unorganized last minute, but yeah. <laughs> no, it was awesome. It was awesome and good game tonight. Yeah, have fun. Yeah, yeah. My, right. two of my players have already arrived, so. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right.